Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today um, at the Florence Nightingale Foundation webinar series. I'm Lucy Brown. I'm the Director of Nursing and Deputy Director of the Florence Nightingale Academy. Um, and I have the great privilege of introducing uh, Group Captain Di Lam and Major Amos Sims this morning. Um, just to make you all aware, we are recording um, today's session and it will be available to view in a couple of days time so you can share it with colleagues um, who weren't able to make today. Um, so just be mindful of any comments that you make. And if you do um, have any concerns about the recording, please do let us know. Um, we will be taking questions at the end of your webinar today. Um, so you can either put them in the chat box or um, you can raise your hand and I'll facilitate the Q&A session at the end. Um, we've got a really, really exciting webinar on caring for the carers. Um, and Amos and Di bring some really great experience and expertise, so we're in for a real treat today. So before we get started, I'm just going to introduce um, Group Captain Di Lam, who is an adult nurse by background, um, specialised in um, the RAF critical care teams. She has a master's in research and then went on to do further study to gain a PhD, really focused on human factors. Um, Di also holds the position as the Defence Professor of Nursing and heads up the uh, academic department of the military. So we're thrilled to have Di and all her expertise and experience this morning. So welcome. Um, additionally, we're very excited to welcome a, uh, Major Amos Sims, who's a mental health nurse by background and a psychotherapist. Um, Amos has been in the armed forces uh, for 28 years, first um, joining in the RAF and then moving across to the army to pursue his uh, um, excitement and uh, to pursue um, a career in research, which is great. Um, and Amos also has a master's in psychotherapy, so brings some really great insight uh, for the caring, caring webinar as well. So without further ado, I'm going to hand across to Diane Amos, and we're really, really excited to be hearing from you today. Thanks ever so much. Thanks, Lucy, and thank you for that um, wonderful introduction. And hello to everybody that's joining us on the call today. Um, this is something that um, both Amos and I are incredibly passionate about. So. I will um, take you through the journey that we've uh, had so far. And the intent of the session is to really summarize what we already know about the cause and impact of increasing stress within nursing. And I know you'll be very familiar within each of your different care contexts. So what we really want to focus on is sowing an adaptive mindset for carers to actually address their own needs from a mental well-being perspective in the same way that they would their patients. And then I'll hand over to uh, Amos halfway through the presentation to focus on the work that he and I have been doing over the last two years um, to describe to you the recovery readjustment and reintegration program forever now forward called R3P, because being in the military, we do like our acronyms, as you probably know. Um, you'd be glad to know we don't have any maps because that's the other thing the military love to do. But we really want to put you in a position of understanding this framework so that you as leaders can apply that to your own um, areas of interest within the nursing profession. So with no further ado, we really all are very familiar, and this is a UK context for, for our international colleagues, um, that we are familiar with the fact that we have a leaky bucket. Uh, if you look at any of the data sources out there, and this one particularly NHS Digital, you'll be very aware that in England alone, we have 94,000 current vacancies. Um, and with the work that's been going, the phenomenal work that's been ongoing throughout the COVID pandemic, we are very familiar with the fact that the um, demand is outstripping or has been outstripping supply. However, I don't want to focus that completely on the negativity because we must acknowledge that there's some brilliant work that's been undertaken in the last few years to address some of those leaks. And we are managing to plug some of those holes. Uh, and again, from a UK context, if you are again looking at the data and, and be aware that it is collated September to, to September, that the registration has been increasing. And in 2020, that was by 2.6%. And then up to September 21 so far, that's been 2.8%. So there is a phenomenal amount of work that's going on out there to, to really encourage people back into the register or new joiners completely. Um, and also what we've also got to do though is balance that with those leaving the register and the phenomenal work that went on to encourage people back and, and, and entice people to stay 
um, brothers in arms to actually face this um, particular onslaught, this unprecedented workload that we're all facing, um, reduced that, that leaving the register by 10.9% in 2020. But we've got, as I say, we've got to balance that with a look at the current data, which only goes to September 21. And it's looking as though that increase is starting to um, go escalate again. So if we look at that in a data perspective, you can, it demonstrates quite clearly there that the, the increase of those joining for the first time the full register, and then balance that with the outgoing and as I said, that, that we've got to be cautiously optimistic because the 2021 figures are now starting to um, go up. And hopefully we can, we can balance that out with a focus on us as the carers more so than we perhaps have done before. Now, we're very, very familiar that the risks are associated with that increasing cycle of fatigue and the potential for burnout due to that uh, escalation in workload. So I was interested to look at you know, the reasons why people are leaving, are deciding to leave the register uh, and looking at those that are UK trained only. Um, and for those that are eagle eyed amongst you, you'll identify that the figures at the bottom don't add to 100 percent. And that's purely because you could select more than one option. But of the figures, 60 percent have retired or decided to retire. Um, but interestingly, or not as the case may be, but interestingly, 25% have regarded that, that they're just facing too much pressure. And also that there is a developing negative impact in that workplace culture. And that may be absolutely combined. That may be one cause and result of the other, that we're all under pressure. We're forgetting our leadership roles because we are absolutely up against it and on our chin straps, as we would say in the military. So, as I say, I don't want to paint that as a negativity because I want to reinforce what the chief executor, uh, executive and registrar of the NMC has been saying. And I'll read out for those people that uh, perhaps are on the telephone. Um, and Andrea Sutcliffe has actually said, despite the tremendous pressures experienced during the coronavirus pandemic, nursing and midwifery professionals across the four nations have shown they are the beating heart of our health and health and care system. But if we don't prioritize recruiting more of the skilled staff we need and retain and support those we have in bold there, then we will continue to lose our dedicated professionals due to work rate related stress and its effect on their mental health. And the point of identifying that is it's on the radar. At the very senior level of our executive, we are very familiar with what we need to do as leaders to protect the phenomenal skills that our nurses are already bringing to that party. So from a, a military perspective, I just want to identify a piece of work that I have certainly been doing over the last few years to look at our enduring operations in Afghanistan, or as we call it, Operation Herrick. And I really wanted to, I focused on the medical emergency response team personnel because I felt that they were very much at the forefront of facing those very challenging environments. But I would like you to think about that challenge within your own operational space. This does have context, so, so bear with me. Um, but, but I looked at all of the um, pre-hospital care personnel within a medical emergency response team, or forever now called MERT. Uh, and I broke that down into, there's, there's the three stages of deployment of our personnel. But again, in your context, preparing for a challenge, actually deploy doing that challenge, and then the recovery phase afterwards. And I really wanted to get their experiential um, understanding from, I'm an ITU nurse by background, I could never go into that pre-hospital space. And I really wanted to understand what resilience factors I perceived they had, but I perceived that I didn't have. But I'll come back to that. We'll, we'll discuss a little bit about the data now and look at the challenge that, that nurses faced within that MERT, within that team. And again, I'll read the nurse's perspective of the stretcher patient came on to the helicopter and it was just something out of a horror film. He was a triple amputee. Um, he wasn't conscious, you know, he looked very young and um, it was just blood and gore. I've never seen anything like it in my entire life. I mean, you know, it was just absolutely horrific. But of course, he didn't have the anatomy to be able to drill where we were originally taught, which was um, 
yeah, quite scary. And that in itself demonstrates, and the narrative used, a horror film, blood and gore, absolutely horrific, very scary. I, I just want you to reflect back on your own faces of challenge. It might not be in the pre-hospital environment, but again, what were your thoughts when you were posed with a challenge that perhaps you would not been prepared for or you would not seen before? And then another interesting point, again, which demonstrates the potential cumulative effect of what you face on, an, uh, on a daily basis. And this one sticks with me. Everybody's worst day would be our every day. If you're out on 10 jobs that day, you've been to 10 worst days. And again, my own experience of working in ITU, if one of your patients dies in one day, it's a sad day. If many patients die, as have been during the pandemic, it's a horrific day. And actually that cumulative effect really does take its toll. But the final um, quote that I, I'll share with you is about how we deal with um, the, the whole challenge of, of coping. And so again, sorry uh, for those that can see the screen. If you're seen out of, you have a bit of a wibble, it was a weak thing. Um, and people used to tease each other. Oh, you're just being weak, get on with it. You know, stop being so pathetic. Um, and actually now we look back and I don't care who we are. Every single person who has done that will have thought of an issue or a time when they thought, wow. And it's about reflection. So at the time we crack on, we just get on with it. And that was a theme that came out. And again, we'll refer back to your own work. You just have to get on with it. The patient's there, the patient need doesn't go away, but what about you? And it's only after the event that you look in and you think, did I really do that? Did I really cope with that? And you put yourself in harm's way. Oh my goodness, did I really, really do that? And so there can be post-traumatic growth as well as the negative sides of the aspects. Now, I really want to paint that for you. So we in the military have adopted this culture um, of, again, just getting on with it, but we're actively recruited for personal characteristics that we have, um, that inherent cohesiveness. And think about yourselves within your own working context. We have this desire in the military to contribute to the success of a, of a mission. We're stoic, we, as, as you've already identified within the previous quotes, we, are fe we have fear of appearing weak and that we're not achieving the success of that mission. And therefore we, we've got our reputation at, at stake. You know, we, we fear losing the trust of our peers and our commanders. So if I move on and identify that within the National Health Service um, context, again, you'll be able to re relate to that. And I've heard many of my NHS colleagues saying exactly the same thing. Your, your desire is to contribute to the success of a healthcare challenge, such as the pandemic. You're constantly fearing to appear weak and not achieving successful patient outcomes. And you fear losing the trust of your peers and of your bosses. So again, it translates very, very well. And again, I'm asking you to reflect upon your own experiences. But this is a quote that I found, which I think says it all. People will often associate crying with weakness, but often it's a sign that we have tried very hard to fight back those tears and have been putting on a show of strength for far too long. And I absolutely agree with that. So going back to what I, what I was learning throughout the, um, the MERT study, what was very clear that I wanted to focus on the recovery model. I wanted to understand whether what we were doing to enable our personnel to retain their resilience was something that was good enough. And what was interesting, and perhaps a little bit naive from my perspective, is that no one could describe exactly what the model should look like, but they knew what it needed to include. And so if you notice, peer support is key throughout all of those preparatory, deployed and recovery phases. To have your colleagues around you that shared the context was very important. An acknowledgement of a transition reaction. So they knew that they were different slightly after being faced with a challenge. Um, and that in itself was, was quite a useful um, acknowledgement to them as well as to me. They were slightly different, but to be prepared for those differences is really key. So the messaging behind um, preparedness is, is key for the recovery phase as well. 
having a sense of belonging within that organization was so, so pivotal because that affects your sense of value, your sense of worth, your sense of contributing to the bigger effect. And it goes back to those um, personal, uh, personal, personal attributes, if I can speak. And then ease of access to support was really, really key and having organizational support to enable that to happen. So these were the key factors but then who knew that we were going to walk out or be out of Afghanistan and very quickly placed in front of another infectious disease, which was what we called Operation Grit Rock, which was in West Africa, uh, as you'll all be very familiar. But it put us within the context that we're facing now. And again, I, I we did another study to look at the preparedness, which is absolutely key. And in that pre-deployment phase, we have a cushion that we surround our personnel with. Um, making them situationally aware, looking at the quality of the equipment, enhancing that team cohesion, putting them into a contextually relevant training environment to enable them to effectively practice their skills. But there's always a sense of vulnerability because in this case, we had no control over time and there was a fear of the unknown because we'd never done this before. Um, so there is always gonna be that element of vulnerability. And in that post-deployment phase, You'll be familiar with collective decompression. The, the term decompression has been used a lot in the, in, the, um, in, in the media about what the military do, but that enables us to collectively support one another with the people that have been involved in the, in the challenge. Um, and therefore we understand how each other is feeling. So you don't have to explain anything. It might just be a look or a word or, or just, something that makes people think yeah you understand exactly what I mean and that element is really really key for support but when I put all these side by side it really was seen as an itch and I just couldn't scratch it because it was still quite amorphous in what this model should look like and that's when the Covid pandemic hit and that's the time where the light bulb absolutely went on relief for all around because we suddenly understood what this actually meant. Uh, and Amos and I got together at that point and we both had this scratch or this itch, sorry, that we couldn't scratch. And we've been to the doctors and he couldn't prescribe anything, but we were able to, to chat to one another and resolved it. And I'll hand over now to uh, Amos to be able to give a little bit more time because I've, I've, I have hurried through purposely to paint the background, but for him now, now to, to talk about the journey of finding a tool that, that will equally apply to yourselves. So I'll, I'll now hand over to uh, Amos and I'll control your slides for you. So thank you, Martin. Um, good, good morning all. Um, Rightio, so diving straight in. Um, Rightio, so the group capture and I, we, we already um, carried out quite a bit of research in this area and hence we had this, this um, itch to scratch because whilst there was a lot of good happening within the UK Armed Forces with our, with our strategies to look after people being sent to remote locations what do we do when we bring them back there were lots of gaps now the group captain did research in sierra leone the department i work in at king's we carried out quite a few studies of our old decompression packages and there were bits that were missing but focusing um, on the experiences of others what, what became quite apparent quickly is uh, in these five points here <clears throat> many people talked about how they wish they'd been able to talk to somebody who could just understand it. Now, the old decompression packages, whilst it did give you time and space away from the, the forward location before you went home, it didn't, tr it didn't truly encourage conversation. It didn't truly encourage the sharing of, of perspectives. In small pockets, you would have seen that. And of course, certain leaders would have sat down with with their um, with their troops to talk about things. But again, another point that was brought up that wasn't happening is again, some people wish that they'd be given an opportunity just to talk about their experiences, not medicalizing, just what happened, why did it happen? What did you do? What did I do? Another point here, the um, the inclusion, not just the inclusion of peers, but for this thing to be centered on peers, not bringing in, outside organizations and we tried that and as a psychiatric nurse I was sent to Cyprus to talk to a group of people who'd never seen me before and whilst the intent was true you know they, they weren't going to talk to me of course they weren't 
The fourth point, needing an organizational support, organizational buy-in. An awful lot of the, 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 the good ideas, if they're not sort of uh, facilitated at the top level, people won't have time. The leaders themselves won't have time to carry these out. So we needed legitimized time to talk. Things were sometimes a little too rushed. And the final point that came out from a lot of our research on the decompression, it was, and this used to hurt, it, was, it seemed to be viewed as a tick box exercise. And that's, that's an awful thing, isn't it? If people don't believe that the leaders are truly invested. So this idea of um, truly being valued for the role that was undertaken. So this was all the previous work we did on what the UK Armed Forces used to do as far as decompression, homecoming briefs, uh, and all the likes. Um, Mark, if you want to pop forward a slide. So as we started to, to sort of look at the, uh, the evidence out there, we, we, um, we pulled together a few ideas. And the next few slides, it's the two, I would say, the central sort of tenets behind what, where our minds were, uh, were. So the first one is about appraisal and coping. And as I said, the previous strategy, tra strategies we used to use, um, they gave you space, they gave you a bit of time, but they didn't really encourage any conversation. Now, the, the idea here, of course, with an individual or a group of individuals that goes through an experience, their, um, their experience will be totally unique. It will be, it will be um, very personal to them. It will be based on what they've seen before, their previous experiences, their life experiences. So no two appraisals will ever be the same. You've got a, a, a body of 40, 50 people have gone through the same thing that will all have a very slightly different um, perspective on this. Now, what you have there, of course, is then the way we make sense of that event, what we did, what we didn't do, what I did, what I couldn't do, why we were there, why weren't we there, there's an awful lot to think about, isn't there? There's an awful lot to perhaps ruminate on when you go home on an evening after a particularly stressful scenario. And what we were finding really is, and, and from my, my work uh, as a therapist, too many times um, with, with myself and any other mental health professionals out there, you'll sit down with somebody who's been through an experience. And of course they have made sense of it based on what they saw. Of course they have. What did we do? What didn't we do? What did I do? What didn't I do? Their perspective is, it, it's quite, it's not tunnel vision, it's what you see. And then they'll have been ruminating that, on that for years. And uh, there's a few examples that the boot caps and I talked about a long, long time ago now, where I've seen a medic who for years has been ruminating on a thing they thought they could have done. And we always said, if only there'd been an opportunity way back to have had a global discussion about actually what happened that day? What could you do? What couldn't you do? And this one was all about giving a handover on the back of a Chinook, which isn't a particularly easy thing to do. There's lots of noise. They want to get off the ground really quite quickly. But this poor young medic had, uh, had been stuck for years, uh, ruining the fact that she couldn't hand over a mist. And, and that not handing over a mist was why a person died. And you can see how that one perspective event missed so much other information and then you can think of this this scenario so as i'm making sense of of this presentation um, i'm seeing it from one angle of course to truly understand what happened today the boss and i will sit down afterwards and talk about it from both of our perspectives and we will encourage lots of feedback because that will be the only way to learn and move forward so appraisal is so so very important and, and the, the, the main thing here is if we're putting a bunch of people together after being through a tricky scenario, research will suggest the vast majority will be absolutely fine, absolutely fine. But there is a significant minority who will have been part of something that they are now going to be ruminating on. And that is, is where distress, the vast majority of my patients would fit that little description. And now moving on to coping. So there's lots of theories on coping. They all sort of cross and merge. That there is a, a sort of a central theme behind this. But the idea of how do we deal with what we've been through? You know, how do we deal with a scenario? So you've got the emotion-focused coping, which we um, we do a lot of in the military. And you, you, it's a real bone of contention. This isn't it. There's an awful lot of emphasis on the individual upping their individual game, mindfulness, relaxation. They're all very, very good. The the idea of 
strategies that are to do with thoughts and behaviours that basically teach you to um, regulate distress. A very important part of coping, but not the be all and end all. Uh, absolutely not. Problem focused coping. You know, talk, well, meeting it head on, breaking it down into tiny bits and then trying to construct a solution. Of course, that, that's not always possible. And it was the meaning focused coping, which is sometimes held under emotion focus. But this is the idea. It, me, it just feeds into point A appraisal. This is about the idea of a way of coping. If the reason you're not coping is because you're sat at home ruminating on the what could I, should I, didn't I, did I's, the idea of generating a global understanding, a global sitting down and talking to people about what we went through, but not just the facts, the perspectives, and, and what we can hope for. And of course, nothing is 100%, is it, of course. But the idea that this has the potential to allow people to walk away with a more balanced understanding of what happened. And there's so many examples. The, we always say in the army, you know, if you tell me why I'm digging a, a hole, uh, I'll do it. But just to, you know, throw a spade at me and tell me to get on with it. But to understand the bigger picture. And, and there's lots of things, in that, you know, where we couldn't do certain things during the, the pandemic. It's not, it's not just the pandemic, is it? That this has been going on for a long time as a, a ward nurse back in the day. There were things you could do and things you couldn't. And the, the intent was always to try and do everything. So this idea of the appraisal and coping, we felt was missing in all the, all the previous strategies. There wasn't a great deal of conversation that was going to help somebody um, put those final pieces of the jigsaw together. And then moving on to the, the next uh, really central part. Uh, Mom, next slide, please. And this comes down to leadership. So, um, and the first line there, that's the quote from um, the, the Caring for Change. It's a, it's a, it's a, a book that, as it says, West 2017. It's from the King's Fund. Now, um, different leadership styles are required for different scenarios, of course. And I think we, we all know that the military, there's a time to, to raise your voice and there's a time to, to sit and listen. That's absolutely fine. But one of the areas, of course, the group captain I work in is is change and innovation. And this is the, the theme, this is the leadership style, which um, th there's an awful lot to read about it. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the tenets behind it, attending, understanding, empathizing, helping, the idea of building this environment where it's safe to test things, because it's some people are so scared of doing things wrong. Of course, yeah, and that, that is a really a limiting factor, isn't it? If I'm so scared of doing something wrong, I'm never going to take a chance. So the compassionate leadership, that, that, that sort of, um, uh, sort of theory underpinned a lot of where we were going as far as really who is going to deliver this and that that will come on to a little bit later who should be holding this strategy and being front and center now the impact of leadership can't be underestimated so um, again my department does a lot of research in the operational um, deployed space so um, right in the middle of the, the sticky areas um, and there is a greater association with poorer mental health within those people that perceive that their leaders don't care, they don't listen, they take on extra jobs to make themselves look good. There's a greater association with that than there is with combat exposure. And we've done that in Iraq and Afghanistan on, on uh, ships, which they have terrible stresses on board ships. Don't underestimate it. But even for them, it's about leadership. We did it in Sudan, we did it with the special forces. Um, every time we do it, it's the same thing. There is a greater association with leadership, morale and cohesion. Actually, they're the top three. They're, they're the big ones there. But the reason I wanted to talk about the leadership is again, within our studies, the great, it, it would appear that the greatest leadership impact isn't from the top corridor, or you know, we, we call the top corridor, the, the, the suits. In the, in the deployed space, it's the junior NCOs. And thinking about my time back in the ward, your shift leaders, people who probably themselves don't consider themselves to be leaders, um, but clearly are. Um, and we have a real structure in the armed forces. Of course, you're having the NHS um, empowering leadership at different levels. So the, um, the idea about where is this going to be delivered, it absolutely is not about a person like me or a padre or a welfare person leading this whole thing. That's where lots of things in the armed forces, I have to be honest, from my own beloved profession have fallen down. 
You know, we, we're not the best people to take these things forward. So on, on to the next slide, please, Mark. I think that really is just a, it's not, I've got, I'm, I'm not getting any money from uh, Mr. West, but it's a good, it's a good one to read. So just a quick plug there. Um, and, and then moving on, <laughs> moving on. So where we, again, based on all the research we've done, an awful lot of uh, work on military leadership, then looking at what we were learning so far about what it is we feel is missing in our plan to try to support people through tricky situations, we're really centered here on the role of leadership within it. Absolutely visible, utterly visible, not, absolutely not, setting up the thing and then disappearing off the tea and toast whilst everybody else gets on with the conversation. Invested, they've got um, front and center, taking part, listening, talking, all the way through the whole thing. Accessible is always very difficult because those on the top corridor will have phenomenal um, diaries that are chocker full of all sorts of stuff, but it's it's doing the best to be available. Again, I, I did, I went to a meeting in my, in my garrison a while ago, and as the meeting went on, the senior officer slowly disappeared. And that obviously gave a nod to the senior soldiers to disappear. And in the end, it was me and a bunch of couples, not acceptable. And, and you know, a few opinions were shared after that. And it's this one at the bottom, conveying worth to the team. Um, um, Group Captain and I, we've already been doing some evaluation on this and um, not to sort of dwell on that too much, but one of the big themes that comes through is this idea of feeling valued um, for what we've done. It's a simple thing, but you can't underestimate um, the, the power of this as far as the leadership goes. Um, so um, next slide, please. Righty-ho. So, um, when we started to put this into a plan as to how are we going to do this, the, the idea was, I guess it's, um, as I say, left of art, do we just get a meeting together where we say, let's all have a, a, a loose conversation about what we, we've been through? That's, that's not, not a great idea. A lot of the work that we did in the build-up to um, the academic paper behind this was looking at um, all the evidence from previous pandemics and associated scenarios and looking for the themes looking for those sort of things that, um, and to be honest, that these five just kept coming up time and time again. Now, these are the areas that people ruminate on during an event and long after. So these are the things that we, if we're thinking, let's get a conversation going where um, what we don't want, if this is all about people not going home and ruminating about what they couldn't do and should have done and all that sort of stuff, these five themes kept coming up time and time again. The morally injurious experience. This is an awful lot is being written about. This has always been around. I mean, you can take this back to um, uh, the Greek tragedy Medea in 461 BC, um, where Medea, you know, the, the decision there was, it's terrible this, but do I kill my children or do I, you know, hand over to the, the baddies? So moral injury has always been there. But I think it was about, it was in the early 2000s, um, that a lot of academics started looking at it. And when academics look at things, they tend to define them. And when you define them, you can start to say what it is and what it isn't. And the morally injurious experience, this is about, you know, uh, things that, uh, did I see something that I don't like? Um, did I not do something or have I witnessed others? Interestingly, uh, a lot of the research in moral injury now is the thing that seems to be causing the most distress is a perception of betrayal rather than um, you know, me having been part of something that I goes against my moral beliefs or or not doing things. And we uh, we went through the research. And we found lots of themes um, within medical the medical world. Things like the consequences of limited resources, um, balancing uh, risk. You know, um, perceptions of end of life. That was a theme that came up. I you know I, I never that was never really an area. Uh, I was a theatre nurse before a psych nurse, so it doesn't often happen, does it? But I know nurses and medical professionals take a lot of pride, don't they, in how end of life is, is managed and all that sort of thing. Um, and I guess that was really not the same during this, this pandemic. So there was lots of themes that came up, the guilt association with people having to leave their families. So there were lots of morally injurious experiences that people were lingering on, ruminating on. Could I have done this? Should I have done that? The other side, the other, uh, one of the other themes, vulnerability, uh, just purely the fear, the anxiety of, of the threat of everything that, that we're in, engaged in. Um, vicarious at times, hearing about 
uh, other healthcare workers. That was a, a theme that came up an awful lot in the research um, discussion about contagion, contagion outside. Um, so lots of vulnerability, then death and suffering. This is sort of a link, linked a little bit with some of the research on compassion fatigue, which is quite relatively well documented, I think. Um, it, it's just very tiring, isn't it, to, to, to listen to suffering, to be part of that sort of cycle. So within this theme, there was lots of conversations about people distressed by the dramatic deterioration, the sense of powerlessness with everything that's going on around them. Um, um, relatives being unable to be with their, um, their, 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 well, their relatives, they're dying. You know, if they weren't allowed in the ward to sit and hold their hand in those last few moments. Um, interestingly, lots in here, lots of links with um, those who work in sort of the biomedical sciences who are analysing the samples. They don't see the person, but they know what's going on. You've got, you really can't underestimate the wide reaching impact of, of you know, seeing something and knowing where this is going. You know, this, is, this is inevitable death and, and this sort of several conversations. Professional and, and personal challenges, uh, a big theme again, which was causing lots of distress. The idea about um, media responses and um, communication within the organizations, the agreed length of time on tasks, um, availability of kit, PPE, process. I mean, this is again, um, uh, uh, lots of lots of this within the um, the evaluation that the boss and I are doing, um, and I, it, it's going to happen. You know, people are moved at short notice, but sometimes you think, you know, could we have done that a little bit better, perhaps just a little better, a bit more thought. But this, not all of these themes are supposed to be about dragging out uh, dragging out negative conversation. The first three clearly are are going to you know, be less positive, but. This was a theme where we started to get conversation about the camaraderie, the openness, the inspirational colleagues, the, the sharing a common purpose. And if I want someone to go home and ruminate tonight, I'd rather, you know, that's what they're ruminating on rather than what they didn't do. The contribution to the global effort, global effort and all that kind of stuff. And then finally, um, the expectations. And this is always um, an interesting area. And a lot of people will, um, that there's there's a lot to be said for trying to maintain links after a team disperse because a lot of the 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 sadness the rumination is on you know deflation on leaving a team that was doing something so worthwhile missing colleagues missing friends missing the experience returning to a mundane job sense of unfinished business there was lots of about the expectations of what next and again there's an area here where moral injury or moral distress is now being researched a lot more there's another area that we're doing, well, lots of people, not just Kings, are working on post traumatic growth. Now, I said at the very beginning, the vast majority of people who go through traumatic experiences will, will be okay and they will grow and they will develop professionally and personally. They will be absolutely fine. A number will not. So, we've always known about this, this idea of post traumatic growth. So, I think we need to talk about it a little bit more because. There are many people who don't realize that that horrible thing that I'm about to, to do, if I frame this in the right way and support people in the right way and afterwards talk about it in the right way, it could be one of the greatest things you know, they've done or we've done. Um, next slide, please, Mark. Next slide. Um, so this is really a bit of a summary of how we all brought it together. Um, so what is the, the R3P? It's a, a leadership model early conversations within both the military and the NHS. There were quite a few times where um, mental health professionals suggested they should be front and center. I couldn't disagree on, there's a few things in this world I disagree on, and that's one of a big one. I have no place at the front. Um, the model would be led by the leaders, delivered by leaders at different levels, but with very clear signposting. If this is causing you distress, if when you go home tonight, there are you now realize I'm ruminating on things. See those people on the back corridor, the welfare, your pastoral support. We in the military we have padres galore, They're absolutely fantastic. And then, and only then, you've got people like me. I'm way down the line of people you need to talk to and um, when when distress comes about. We we like to call it the first conversation. Lots of good leaders, lots of leaders have done this. You know, the idea of a group of people come back. The first conversation, how are you? How was it? Let's have a chat. There's no agenda, not really. You're not looking to pull things apart. It's a first conversation. The second conversation, 
that's the one with the welfare or the padre or you know or whoever whoever introduced by a senior member of the organization um you know we we last time we talked about this you know the boss standing up at the front and saying this is what our aim was this is what we did this was our intent you know you know not lots of you know, thank you for what you've done, but they have to be at the very front engaged in it from the very beginning, because if this were to come back and, and be perceived as a, a tick box exercise, I, you know, I think I'd cry, quite frankly. So, uh, yeah. The positive culture of support, this is a big area in the military and everywhere else, isn't it? We're always looking for innovative ways to improve health seeking. You know, we, in, in the medical, in the military, we've really enhanced our mental health services the skill sets that we have, you know, in our departments, but that's no good if you aren't getting people from the first conversation to this line. So one of the big areas about R3P is it really is um, a signposting stigma um, uh, strategy as well. The idea of um, the boss at the front saying, let's talk, it's okay to talk about this. And if something is a little bit upsetting, don't just go home and ruminate on, on your own. So this was, again, it was part of our strategy to get people who are distressed. Um, because we, we, um, we have a real problem in the UK Armed Forces. Um, but the rates of mental health, so it, you, you'll see uh, publications all the time about the rates of mental health in the UK Armed Forces. Our statistics will say things like 0.5% um, uh, of the population will present with PTSD. But that's only the people that seek help. So at Kings, we do a study, a cohort study of the entire armed forces, and you can read it, it's out there, but 20% um, of the UK armed forces meet the criteria right now for a common mental health disorder. But how, how many of them are coming and seeking, seeking help? The, the whole concept behind the, the meaning-based coping that underpins this is the idea of generating, as I said, the fourth point, a global meaning of the event. So the other side of this, the flip side, will be a person with a single polarised view of what they did, what they didn't do. That has the potential to lead to distress and, and often does in, in, in mental health. And, and the, the point at the bottom there, this, is a, this really is a signposting exercise, trying to get those that need help, that significant minority, but making sure that they realise, OK, I really would benefit from chatting to welfare, hard race or, or whoever. And that was the, the final structure. I believe that could be the last slide, Mum. It is indeed, but, and thank you. I know that this has been a, a whistle-stop um, tour through through what has been many years of activity uh, and making sense of what we understood from our various um, models over the years with different um, contextual uh, environments, and that. In essence, what, what you've just said there, Amos, is that this is something that is applicable to no matter what stressful environment you find yourselves in. It's that first conversation and being empowered to have that first organization, uh, or, or, sorry, that first conversation within an organizational permission to do so, mm -hmm. given the, being given legitimized time to, to have that and consider that as an important element as opposed to the patient need just get on with it or as we say suck it up wet pants and get on with it that that's not the mentality we want to un unhinge that process of culture that's developed over the years and to put ourselves as carers at the forefront of uh, of our own well-being because as the slide showed you right at the beginning we haven't got the um, capacity anymore to, to think about it in that way we've really got to look after the professionals that we have uh, and to retain them and re-motivate re them to stay, give them some positivity within all the negativity that comes across in everybody's TV screens every day. Um, so it's just a different lens. That's what we wanted to say, a different lens through which to look. We're in learning lessons all the time in the military, and this has been given legitimized time with our senior executive absolutely front and center behind this. Uh, and having that opening comment about our senior executive saying, thank you, thank you for what you are doing in a heartfelt way. It dismisses that whole tick box exercise um, that we may well have felt we were involved in before. And, and I hope you have been able to reflect 
within your own contexts of how you yourselves can be empowered to undertake this. We have, we have lots of um, uh, in, inroads, we have our contacts there. Please do reach in. We've given you the links within the presentation that you can go and the R3P paper um, is freely accessible. So even we've given you a schedule of how an example of how a day could be run and it doesn't need to be an entire day. It can be fitted fitted around your environment and how you work. And it doesn't necessarily have to be rolled out as a package to the entire organization at once. It's about teams and people that share the context of the exposure to the challenge that, um, that, that you have equally as team members shared. So to bring in a wider team, as we explained, that, that wouldn't understand the context is of limited value. It has to be your small team. So you could do this in a breakout room um, with people at the end of a shift or halfway through a shift or, or however you would want to do it. You don't have to go somewhere external to the organization to do this, but it's having that legitimized time to take the time to think about and reflect upon your experiences rather than, as Amos said, go home and cogitate. Uh, and that then makes the issue bigger than Ben-Hur and, and you lose your capacity to cope and perform because you're you're um, ensconced within that um, thought process that's going on in your own mind that could equally be just dispersed very quickly by somebody saying, do you know what, I feel that way as well. And then suddenly a problem shared is a problem halved. Uh, and that old adage does really feature here. Um, but we wanted to leave 15 minutes for um, questions and true military precision. We've left 15 awesome minutes. So <laughs> ask some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Diane Amos. What an incredible presentation. Thank you so much. And so many bits we can take away from this and put into practice. So as, as Diane rightly said, we've got 15 minutes for questions from you all. So if you don't feel comfortable asking, um, you can pop a question in the chat box. I think we've got three comments down there already, which I can start with. But if you would like to ask Diane Amos a question, please put your virtual hand up or you can actually put your actual hand up too. And I've taken note that the reactions are down the bottom on the right hand side if you don't know where you're have to raise your hand to ask a question. So I'll just go to the chat box initially. Um, well, just some interesting quotes, um, it, some confirmation, Amos, me too. I think Michael West's work is fantastic. And if any of you can take the time to read his Compassionate Leadership um, book, it is really worth it. And um, something I, I it's, it's certainly um, shaped my leadership style over the years as well. Um, and it's mentioned in the Francis Report 2010. Um, we've got um, sort of just that it's really, really helpful. And actually the, it is really valuable saying thank you to your teams. Um, people want to feel valued and that they're doing a good job and celebrating successes is so, so important. It's something that, unfortunately, I think it might be Amy, it said it's really, really helpful. She was only asked about how she was in her appraisal in six months. So it's so, so important as leaders, we take that time to thank and ask how our staff are. So does anyone would like to start off with a question? Anyone brave enough? Everybody's gone shy. Well, <laughs> what people are thinking about it, and again, I have no uh, in, hidden investment in um, Mr. West's or Professor West's work, but certainly when I opened that book and started to read some of the some of the verses within there, you know, I was saying about that light bulb went on. Suddenly, mm -hmm. it became very clear what we'd been alluding to over all of those years. What we'd actually described was compassionate leadership, but hadn't termed it as such. And that suddenly became a peg that we could hang our hat on, so to speak. Uh, and it validated, you know, in my mind, what we'd found so far. Uh, and so I found it quite, um, well, just a wonderful experience. I know that sounds really random, but a wonderful experience reading it because I could put it into my own context and then suddenly have, I'm um, quite a visual thinker, but suddenly having a route map of how to address some of these thorny issues, which as we've explained, are so different and so unique for every single one of us. And the first thing we think about is the fact that we see ourselves as weak because we're not coping mm. um, in, in some way, but it's all about perception. Uh, and, and reading that book made me think, I'm not the only one. <laughs> Other people have seen yeah. these things as well. And that's the importance of showing the quotes as well about how different people's experiences can be expressed in a certain way. And, and to hear them talk about their own experiences, you think to yourself, well, do you know what? I, I felt that way in the past. Uh, and to hear you say, it makes me think I'm not so weak after all, and I'm not a freak or any of those types of words that people might want to use. So, so I, I, as I say, I have no financial benefit in that book, but I just found it one of those 
can't put down type books mm. um and something that that the more it was a page turner is what i'm trying to say i couldn't i couldn't stop reading it um, oh just had a question come through from fiona i think it is here but quickly um thank you so much for sharing this we've tried using the trim model to some success here but this feels more responsive one of our biggest issues is about how senior executives are seen to be thanking staff um do you have any tips on this and I'll, I'll get you on there's a second question so i might get you to answer that one first um could, could i dive in so trim is an interesting one i i I've, I've only this week rewritten the trim manual policy for the uk armed forces trim is very good um but it's for that that would be um and i've got nothing invested in that one but that that would be for a single incident that that really is the idea so we have them running concurrently i mean we we're trying to do an awful lot of work into research, uh, research into trim. What does it do? What doesn't it do? It, it is it is good at identifying distress. So if you were to trim a group of people who've been through something tricky, the scoring process, which I'm, I'm presuming you're using the same as, as, as the one design, that will identify distress. So the idea then is that those distressed are signposted. So it's good for a single incident, whereas the R3P, is, this is really designed more for periodical use it's a leadership tool every so again it wasn't really just for the end of covid so i think when when the, when we first talked about this sort of march 2020 give or take it was a it was a is, is covid going to be you know tea and medals by christmas sort of thing and clearly that's that's not the case is it so but but this is being used um r3p is also being used operationally for those coming back from afghanistan recently so it could be used at the end of a, a period of sustained pressure. But our conversation over the last week with Boss and I, you know, we're wondering whether we're, we're wondering whether we're going to see a change in mindset within our own medical services that actually the health service personnel are always working hard. They always have been, always will. It wasn't just a pandemic. So is this something that we need to be thinking about periodically, like a wash up? So Trim and R3P are part of the same um, overarching process within the military, but do target specific things. So um, it, it's a, yeah, that's, that's my thought on Trim. Thank you, Amos, thank you. Um, and any tips on how to engage with senior execs to get them to, to thank staff? And that was a, a second question there from Fiona. How to um, engage? Well, I think it's about um, reminding staff, isn't it? And, uh, and I guess as they go up the seniority ranks, just to remind them that actually they were at one point on the hall, on the shop floor. Um, and it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do to come out and share your thanks. And it it's not just about doing it on a an ad hoc basis like receiving a letter of thanks at Christmas. Yes, that's that's nice to have, but it needs to be updated on a regular basis. And to see the senior executive walk in the floor on a more mm. regular basis. Again, it's about that investment and that engagement. How would I suggest that you, you go about that and knock on doors and remind senior executive of their role within this? I'd hate to say, because my, <laughs> my response would probably be different to yours and I'd hate to get you into trouble. Uh, Put you into muddy waters there but you know i think the best way to do it in whatever um departmental meetings that you have that some of your senior executive may come to and then go and present maybe a higher level um, executive meeting is just to include that requirement into the narrative so whether it be, gets captured in minutes or it, it's part and parcel of, of each of the the chairs of each meeting to pass on up the line I think we've got work to do. It's about messaging and and clearly in, in the earlier slide that I showed you with the registrar of the NMC, Andreas Sutcliffe, um, demonstrating that we've got to focus on looking after our people, then that's where we've got to start in bringing the reminding our senior executive that that's important, it's a key element, and that they are as engaged in it as we are you know, at the tactical level. Um, so yeah, messaging, you know, as much as you can talk about this, do so, and eventually that message will get through. Great, thank you, Di. I've got quite a few questions popping up now, um, and lots of messages of thanks. A lot of people found this very helpful. Um, Kate has asked, what advice would you offer for supporting staff the uncertainty of time frame, duration of high stress events? That's a really good question given. Um, for many of us, I think it's been the unre unrelenting nature and unpredictability of working for COVID, there seems to be no end 
end to it. So what advice would you give to the teams? Great question, Kate. I'm, I'm anxious that it's me doing the talking, so I don't know if you want to come in at him also. <laughs> I, you know, I, I was thinking, it, I think it refers back to in, initially when we maybe perceived COVID to be a little bit like an operational tour, it will have a very distinct beginning, middle and an end, and then we do mm. this at the end. That's too simple, isn't it? And as, as this has rolled on, that's, I, I guess, where our conversation is that it's not a case of waiting for the quiet period when we think it's all over. I think um, it's the idea of, because uh, all we can do is our best. I guess if, a, if a, a group of leaders said, when should we do this? We don't know when it's going to finish. Okay, let's do it now. Let's do it at this particular day, on this particular week. And, and we can only ever do our best. But I think the idea of maybe, you know, as with an operational tour, this would come at the very end, clearly. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's a long tour, you could do something else. But I, I, I think the idea is, is just making a decision um, and conveying that to the, the people when you organise the whole thing. And, and it's the transparency, isn't it? We're going to do this now. You know, we can't wait till the very end because we don't know when the end will be. We don't know when the pressures will relax. So we have made a decision that we're going to sit and we're going to have a day on this week. And let's have a let's have a conversation now, knowing that there will be more to come afterwards. But if this is a little bit like taking a long drive from from Salisbury, where I am, to the north of Scotland, it's akin to pulling the car over every, you know, 100 miles, 200 miles, getting out, stretching your legs, taking a breather, rather than just keeping going until I get to the end and my my 600 pound mini is just falling apart. So, you know, it's it's a periodic thing. I, again, this was a conversation last week about trying to influence the mindset of our military leaders to, to start thinking about something. Because we've been historically very reactive, the armed forces, and we're good at reacting really quickly. Bang, we're out the door. But are we so good when we've got time to plan and, uh, and the like? So... Um, I, think, well, yeah. I think to add to that, and you're right, it's got to be an ongoing programme and we've been evaluating our R3P uh, and the, the recent data has demonstrated that, uh, as uh, Amos alluded to, not everybody is impacted in the same way and it absolutely depends on, on the severity of the exposure uh, to the task. So, so there were some that felt very much that, depending on what high intensity workload they had, that if they scored their anxiety levels high at the beginning, they would then they would undertake R3P and a, a significant, uh, statistically significant proportion found that it, it enabled them to lower their anxiety levels afterwards. However, with caution, uh, other individuals felt very much that this hadn't enabled them to reach closure. So again, that validates the necessity for this to be an ongoing thing and particularly through an ongoing un uncertain um, outcome or, or length of duration of this. Everybody's scared and new, new variants happening all the time. People's anxiety levels will increase in, in accordance with that. And we don't know when that news is going to hit. So it's about maintaining that messaging, because otherwise, if it's a one stop shop and you just do it, it immediately then reverts, reverts back to being the tick box exercise. So again, it's about leadership managing this throughout its entirety and indeed afterwards. So absolutely right. I think it has to be an ongoing programme. Thanks, Di. Thanks, Amos. I love the analogy of the mini as well. It's <laughs> a really good analogy. I think I'll take that away. Um, just of course, we're actually running out of time, unfortunately. We've got two minutes left. I think we've got just lots of messages of thanks, Di and Amos. And obviously, we've got the contact details. We'll share the slides with you as soon as we finish. And their recording will be available in a couple of days' time. Um, just uh, lots of words of thanks, and people really, your presentation has really resonated with um, the, the attendees today, which is really great. So, thank you for your comments in the chat box. Um, that seems a quick one we can answer. Just everyone saying the importance of debriefs, they're so, so important, it's true. And then, just to reiterate, I guess you're making sure you've got that permission now. Um, I think we've probably got one, just something quick. Look, again, many thanks. Thank you for your presentation in the chat box. So I think we'll wrap up now. Thank you so much for joining us. It's really great to see so many people on the, on the webinar. Um, for those of you that have found it really helpful, please do share it with your colleagues. Um, the link will be with you shortly and be available on YouTube in a couple of days once we've had time to edit. Um, it's been great to have um, Di and Amos. A very, very special thank you for joining us. And if you've enjoyed today, this time uh, next week, so we've got... Um, uh, on the 10th next week, Di is joining us again with your colleague um, 
Alan Brooker, who'll be coming to talk about ethical decision making. So that'll be at one o'clock a bit of a later start. So please join us next week if you're able to. If you can't, we'll be recording it again so you can share it. Um, so please do let us know. We're looking at running webinars every week. Um, so they've been so popular. So if there's any topics you'd like us to run for you, please do let us know. Either pop it in the chat box or drop us an email. We'd love to hear from you. Um, but thanks for joining today. Have a good uh, rest of Friday and a good weekend if you're not working. And um, look after yourselves. Thanks very much.